I would think it was so appropriate that we sung this song because honestly, as I was preparing this message, I think the greatest story of the cross, and I remarked in my first service, that the greatest story is love. And if you miss that, you miss all of it. I, I want you to gravitate toward that today because I, I know the cross is hard to look at. I know it is. It's very difficult. Matter of fact, we, we were going to show some pictures of the Passion of the Christ, and I had mixed emotion about it, because sometimes people look at that and they really have a hard time looking at the cross and how cruel the cross was. But if we can just make ourselves today visualize Jesus suffering and dying upon that cross and re relate that to love, it will really cause you to draw closer and nearer to the Lord. Because before there was a resurrection Sunday, there was a cross. Amen. And today, I know it might be unusual, but we're going to start out this lesson talking about the weight of the cross. Turn to somebody and say, the weight of the cross. Now, are we talking about the physical weight of the cross? What's the answer? cross was probably heavy and hard to carry, and especially when you understand the beating that Jesus took. But we're not talking about that kind of weight. We're talking about the weight of our Lord and Savior leaving the splendors of heaven and walking upon this earth, the place of imperfection and sin, being misunderstood for 33 and a half years, especially during the time of his ministry, which scoped, which spanned three and a half years. But in this period of time, he proves to us more than anything else. The Bible says, hereby we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us. I think the biggest thing about the cross of Christ is to understand that he who knew no sin became sin. Yes. See, you know, maybe you don't understand that, but here's how that works. See, Jesus had so many types and shadows of him in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, the Bible says, and I do this, so if you're new, you say, he's walking around, he may walk to me. I might, but don't, don't worry about it. I won't touch you. Try not to. But throughout the, the whole scope of the Bible, all of the Bible, it says, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. Behold, it is written in me. So when we see a lot of the things in the Old Testament, it, it foretells about Christ, right? The Lamb of God that was sent to take away the sins of the world. The tabernacle of God that was sent to walk among men. So we, we see that dwelling place of the Lord coming and being revealed, but that Old Testament tabernacle represented Him, the priesthood. Everything about that represented Christ. But one of the things that we see in the time that we call Yom Kippur, which is the celebration of the turning away, the tossing away of sins for another year, where the priest went into the holiest of holies, not without blood, and he, he sprinkled blood upon the mercy seats. And besides that, there was... Uh, uh, not only a bullock, but there was also a, a goat that was used in that cleansing ritual, but not just one, there was two. One of the goats was sacrificed and, and they used the blood for cleansing. The other goat was called the scapegoat. Everybody say the scapegoat. Yeah. See, you've heard that term before. Somebody had become a scapegoat, right? That term actually is a biblical term. And, and the scapegoat was was a code that, that they brought before the people and the priesthood and they confessed the whole sins of the nation upon the scapegoat. And then they sent it outside the camp. Well, guess what? Jesus was the scapegoat. And upon him was placed the entirety of the sin of all mankind. Let me tell you, that was a very, very heavy way. It was something that Jesus knew from the beginning. Matter of fact, the Bible said he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. But I, I believe he knew this the whole time. He was alive and walked upon the earth. He understood that 
Ultimately, he would go to the cross and he would bear the sins of all mankind. It just causes me to love him more. To understand that. He who knew no sin became sin. Last week, we, we talked about the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We talked about how that all these things culminated five days before the actual crucifixion. We, we studied about that and, and, and thought about how wonderful it was that finally mankind began to recognize him for who he really was. Hosanna, blessed is the king that comes in the name of the Lord. I'm sure the angels were rejoicing. But within just a few days' time, we went from that very high point to the lowest of lows. Jesus tells his disciples, let's prepare for the Passover. And before they partook of the Passover supper, Jesus dons a towel girds himself and then begins to wash the disciples feet. How many remember that? How many apostles were there? Twelve? You're right. Who was amongst them that would be thought about today? His name was Judas. And we're talking about love and mercy and grace. Did Jesus wash Jude, Judas' feet? What do you think? Yes. yes, he did. Knowing that he would betray him, Jesus humbled himself and washed his feet. Or took a supper with him, even supped from the same cup as Judas. It was from there that Jesus foretold that and told others that he was going to be betrayed and, and the man that was going to do this was the man that was supping from the cup and, and he sent Judas out to do what he would do. At that moment, Jesus takes his disciples and he goes to a place called Gethsemane. Gethsemane, we... Maybe in your mind's eye, I, I've tried to be there in my mind and see pictures and try to understand what this was like, but it was a very powerful place for more reasons than just, you know, it being a garden. It was a powerful place because there Jesus would pray that famous prayer before the Father. He would pray about us and thank God for the, the, the church. Let me tell you something, the church, he said, upon this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's what he said. And he prayed to the Father. He said, I want them to be one, even as you and I are one. That prayer come from Gethsemane. Yes. That's why today I tell you that the organizations and denominations need to become a dinosaur, and they need to pass away. So that the prayer of Jesus would come to pass. Because right, that's the heart of God. How many believe that? Amen. So Jesus prays these things. He talks about glorifying thy son. He, some of the most famous words we get is in Mark chapter 14, verse 35. So I, I had you grab your Bible. Would you turn there? We're going to read in Mark chapter 14 a little bit today. I'm going to find some things. And then we'll culminate all of this with the, the resurrection of Jesus. But I want to talk first about the way to the cross. In all of the scriptures... It's probably here that we see the humanity of Christ more than any other place. One of the things that you must believe to be a believer is to believe that Jesus Christ is Messiah. Am I right or wrong? Yes. Knowing he's Messiah, we understand and recognize that he is deity. Right or wrong? In other words, he is part of the eternal Godhead. We must understand that, receive that, and recognize that for our salvation. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. Amen. It is he that made us, not we ourselves. That's the scripture. 
Jesus Christ was the creator. God, through Christ, created everything that was made. There was nothing made that was made without Him. There was nothing made that was made without Him. So He was the creator of all things. It's by Him that we even understand or know the Father, that we can recognize the Father because He was the image of the invisible God. So there's a lot of things we could say about that. It is a study within itself, but here he is, come to the earth to bring forth salvation. And he, uh, of course, being deity, uh, we would think everything that he said was deity and represented deity. And we go to Gethsemane and we hear him pray this prayer. And suddenly he doesn't sound like deity. And I've told you before that, that God doesn't hold any secrets. And there's reasons why God exposes things. He wants us to understand and come to a deeper revelation. One of the things you need to understand about Jesus is that to be the, our example and to be the perfect son, we must understand these things about him. Even the son, the Bible said, learned obedience by the things that he said. That's word. Probably a word that I never heard growing up, yeah. but it's word in the past. And it's an important word. It shows us that every one of us are in a, this process, and we're, we have humanity, and we have things that are just human about us that God looks at, and he still loves us. Look, look at your neighbor and say, you're just human. Sometimes, sometimes you don't act like you're saved. <laughs> Amen. Sister Tyner would tell you that, being honest with you, there's times that I just wonder about his salvation. <laughs> but we're human. And in this particular passage of Scripture, we hear Jesus say something like this. In fact, this is what he said. And he went a little further. He took his disciples, he went to the garden, he left most of them there. He took Peter and John, uh, James and John, with him and went to a certain place. And he even left them a little bit further. And just a stone's throw away, he was praying before them. And he prays this part of the prayer, and we hear it. And as he went a little further, he fell to the ground, and he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. That your salvation is hinging upon these moments. All of heaven is listening as he prays this prayer, struggling as a man. But this hour passed for me. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. You can do anything. Maybe there's something else. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And all of heaven took a big sigh of relief. going to be obedient. This is hard for me. I never knew any sin. I don't know if you can imagine this or feel this in his heart. That he's completely holy and righteous. Do you know how ugly sin is? I think you do. How terrible 
sin is. I think you know. Because it was your sin and my sin that he was dealing with. It wasn't, I don't think, I don't believe as ugly as crucifixion it was. It was devised in such a way to inflict as much pain as humanly possible and it exact that pain over a period of time so that death would be prolonged. Man had gotten so perverse in thinking that they liked to watch people die. And by this time in history, they've become experts right. in pain. Right. And the crucifixion was as cruel as they could have devised. And I don't think it was that. I think it was the sin. I think it was your sin right. and my sin. that he was struggling with. So Jesus prays. And he steps back and he looks and everybody's asleep. Yeah, how many ever felt like that? You're the only one left. Nobody understands me. Nobody cares. Everybody's going to sleep. I told them I wasn't feeling well. Yeah. Right? Well, like, amen. The ultimate slap in the face is when everybody turns their back on you when they know what you're going through. Right. That's right. And we've been there. Can you imagine how Jesus felt? He poured his life into these people. Right. Right. He poured his heart into them. I mean, they've been through thick and thin together. They saw the miracles. Right. And they still yet fell asleep. He tells them, wake up. Hours here. Suddenly, they see the torches come through the garden. They're here. It's the time I've told you about. Judas runs up to him and kisses him. Yeah. The chief priests and the elders and their hypocrisy seems like they're winning. The Bible says they laid their hands upon him and they took him. Mark chapter 14 and 46. And one of them that stood by, drew a sword, and smote the a servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. Proud moment. The chief amongst them, the apostle Peter, whom some was, would say would be the first pope, takes out his sword and shwack, cuts off the man's ear. His name was Malchus, the guy. Can you see Jesus shaking his head? Are you kidding me? Don't we look like a mess? This ragtag group. I can only imagine some of the prayers that Jesus prayed over them. <laughs> but having said that, I can only imagine some of the prayers he's prayed over me. That's right. Amen. So you don't understand. The Bible said he ever liveth to make intercession. Amen. As your priest and my priest, he stood on your behalf many times before the Father. So I know they're a mess, and I went to the cross for them. I know they're all screwed up, but I want you to remember the blood that was shed for them. Yes. Yeah. He pleads your cause today. We ought to give the Lord a hand clap of yeah. praise for that.
Jesus was telling him, he said, I go away to prepare a place for you, and where I am, there you may be also. He said, if I go, I'll come again. You know, all these things he was saying, and I'm glad that, that he's doing that. But besides that, his place of priesthood, we missed that for so many years, and we didn't talk about it. And yet the whole book of Hebrews is written about that. Right. About the place of Christ right now. What, what is Jesus doing besides, you know, hammering up some things in heaven? More than likely, he spoke it into existence like he did in the world. But, but what's he do besides that? Intercession. Amen. Loving on you. That's right. Being the captain of your salvation. Yes. Praise God. Yes. He's the captain of your salvation. I, I told you what I want to say to you. Once you're saved, you almost have to work at being lost. Yeah. You know why he loves you that much? He cares about you that much? That, that you almost have to work at this because let me tell you something if he has to burn away everything you have just to get your attention right. he'll do it Amen. just to save your soul right. some of you have been through hell and back you haven't got that yet but he loves you so much he's letting you go through some things so that you'll wake up turn to your neighbor and say pastor gave me permission God. Don't we look like imbeciles sometimes? But the Bible said after he put the ear back on the soldier, they all forsook him and fled. He was sold out for 30 pieces of silver. Brought before the council, before Pilate and Herod, lied upon. When given the opportunity to release him, the people rather chose Barabbas than Jesus. Verse 27 of the 27th chapter of the book of Matthew. Turn there. I'm trying to work our way through. Knowing what we read. Jesus understood and tried to get others, even all the way up through his mock trial, even though much of the time he opened not his mouth. When he did say something, he let them know, this is the reason I came to this earth. For this cause came I into the world, he said. And he looks at him and he says, listen, I understand you have authority, but you have authority because it was given to you by the Father. Amen. In other words, I'm only here fulfilling His will. Amen. Are you the King of the Jews? <laughs> you say, I am. That's what He said. What you said. So they put a made a plaque for him, right? King of the Jews. The, Jew, the Sanhedrin said, Don't put that up there. He said, Say that he said. Pilate said, What I've written, I've written. So above his cross said a plaque that proclaimed who he was. If we read the scripture, Matthew 27 and 27 says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into their common hall and gathered him into the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him, put on him a scarlet robe, and plaited a crown of thorns, and they put it on his head. Read in his right hand, they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat upon him, and they took a reed and spoke him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe from him, put it on his own raiment, and led him away to crucify him. Beaten with a cat of nine tails, that's what the Romans called it. It was just a whip with sharp bone shards on it that would often tear the flesh and expose the organs. 
It was such a gruesome thing. It was made to carry his cross at Golgotha's hill until he fell, and they compelled another man by the name of Simeon to carry his cross. But seeing him hang there, feeling his agony, as heaven literally turns their back on him. He cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But you must remember, God so loved the world that he gave why did heaven turn their back on Jesus? Because of the love of you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever will believe on him should not perish, but have an everlasting life. Give him a round of applause. Finally, Jesus utters this, these words. He says, it is finished. Hell breathes a sigh of relief. We got it done. See, I can hear him talk to his elves. We accomplished what we set out to do. We killed him. Look at me. You misunderstood what Jesus was saying. Yeah. When he said it is finished, he said, I've accomplished this talking about the fact that you and I have our own cross. Have you ever thought about that? See, Jesus was our example. This is not just a fairy tale. This is not just a story about him. It's a story about your salvation. And what the scripture says about that is that we all have our own cross. Jesus didn't pay this horrendous price so that we could live a life of selflessness and sin or selfishness and sin. But that we could have a real relationship with him. That we could walk with him and understand what it is to live a life of giving and selflessness. Amen. You can overcome the world through transformation because he lives, you can live, but not only in heaven. We find life here on the earth through salvation. Paul talked about the life that I now live. To live is Christ, he said. We find a new life in Christ, don't we? As we take up our own cross, Luke 9 says, the Son of Man must suffer many things. Jesus was telling them before his crucifixion. And be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain on the third day. But now, now, here's where he brings it to us. He said, and said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his own cross daily and follow me. And whosoever will save his life will lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake will save it. I'm about to close, so hang with me. We can't talk about the cross without talking about the cross that we bear. Right. Amen. Today you're sitting here in your nice clothes, living in the best time that man's ever seen, or prosperity than any other time upon the face of the earth. Many of you will go 
to a nice dinner after this with your friends and your family. You live a life that, that people just a few years back couldn't ever even dream about. And yet it's probably our biggest fault and our biggest failure and our biggest demise. The life that we live in the world today is probably the biggest nemesis because we allow things to become our God. But when Jesus talked about the cross, and we must realize that we have nothing to say to him that gave it all. Right? He gave everything. Yeah. He told people, he said, I don't even have a place to lay my head. Right? His whole life was about ministry and giving. So how can we come to him any other way but living our life as a living sacrifice? And he said, if you're going to follow me, he said, you've got a cross to bear too. And he says, you have to deny yourself. One of the hardest things in the world is to deny yourself. Look at me, ladies. It's like having that big chocolate bar in the cabinet. <laughs> and seeing if you can make it last for two weeks. Oh, come on now. Sister Tyner sitting in the back, and I know it's one of her biggest things, you know. We, we've been buying uh, uh, these little uh, uh, ice cream cones in a, in a cone that you can eat. What's it called, Trish? Drumstick. Yeah. Have them in our refrigerator, and, and I'll go in and open up the freezer, and she's been into them. <laughs> But she's trying to behave herself, so, so what I find is like a half-eaten one. <laughs> yeah, I have compassion on her. I realize that's hard, right? <laughs> Jesus talked about our cross and denying herself, and he, said, he made the statement. He said, if you save your life, you'll lose it. What did he mean by that? You know what people think that they think that, and they've been told this throughout most of us throughout our life now, our the younger generations, especially in school. You're the master of your own destiny. You do whatever you choose. You can become whatever you want to be. Do whatever you want to do. And we've created a, a, a monstrosity. And people are so selfish today. They don't care who they have to step on. They're going to get where they're going. But but when you lose your life, what you do is you say, just like Jesus, you say. Not my will, but thy will be done. It's not what I want, but God, what do you want? What do you want from me? We, we've got our cross to bear today, and, and let me tell you something. There's, there's a good news that comes through all of this because Christ gave us an example. And here's what the Bible says. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Here's the good news, is that you and I can live a better life. I didn't just stop at the cross, and today your journey is not just going to stop at the cross that you bear. There's something that we're all working toward, and that is that resurrection experience. To live a life that takes us beyond this world and how many will say it's out of this world? <laughs> it's joy that's unspeakable and full of joy. We are already citizens of heaven and you wonder why sometimes we act the way we do. Hallelujah, those are crazy people. <laughs> it's because in our life of selflessness we have found out that giving actually is what it takes to receive the goodness of God. <laughs> Jesus gave it all, but let me tell you something. On the first day of the week, Luke 24 and 1, very early in the morning they came unto the sepulcher bringing spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. They found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. This was Mary Magdalene, J 
Joanna and Mary, the mother of James. They found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. They entered in and found not the body of Jesus. And it came to pass that they were much there perplexed thereabout. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. As they were afraid, they bowed down their face to the earth and said, The angel said, Why seek ye the living amongst the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. If you go to 1 Corinthians 15, now I suggest you take the time, read that whole chapter. But Paul starts out with the gospel, and he ends up talking about our resurrection. And this is what he says. He said, moreover, brother, and I declare to you the gospel which I preached unto you, which I, you have received, and whereupon you stand, by which you are also saved. Keep in memory what I have teached you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered to you first as I also received how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and how he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. In other words, here's the good news, people. If you receive this, you're going to see your life change because you're not just living for today. Yes. Amen. Yes. But just like Jesus, we have our cross, but if we'll carry our cross, there's a hope of resurrection, and because he lives. That's the, the theme of the whole chapter. In 17, he says, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, and your, your sins, they that are falls, fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. But he said, In this life only we have hope in Christ, for of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. He's risen. Say it with me. He is risen. He is risen. For since by man came death, by man also come the resurrection of the dead. For in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made of life. You, me, every believer. Say it with me. Every believer. Everyone that's carried the cross has this hope. He finishes up that chapter, and here's where we close today. Now I say, brethren, that flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. Amen. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to the pass the saying which is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Today, there's good news. There's an empty tomb. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives. Because I know he holds my future. Yeah. And life is worth living. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. he lives. Oh. He lives. I have a victory today. I'm not burdened down because my life does not consist of what's around me. Right. This world is a troubled place. As you get ready to close your eyes and bow your head. This world is a troubled place, full of problems and turmoil. And I heard what Paul said. He said, if in this life only, if this is all there is, I'm a miserable person. But I can tell you, there's a reason why I carry my cross. It's the same one that Jesus carried his who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That's scripture. Who for the joy, say it with me, the joy. joy. See, weeping only endures for the night, but something happens in the morning. <laughs> 
Some of you are worried about your tomorrows. But today, I know who holds my future.